Okay. Right. Okay, I'm just uh, looking. Sorry, I should find what in my email, Stephen? Uh, no, it's, I didn't send it to you, but I got okay. it to your email um, because it was the transcript of her questions. Got it. Yeah, Sorry. I, Apologies. Yeah. Okay. So I do have a question here that I didn't get to answer. And somebody was asking, how can I test Groking at home with 8 gigabyte GPU? Well, actually, in fact, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the Groking paper and uh, kind of recent Groking work it's not even really done on extremely large models, like a student of ours, like uh, Pascal, whom I mentioned, who did this work on groking. It, it's really a low scale studies because, um, I mean, the models are relatively small and the data set is, it's like a toy thing. And essentially you just kind of, what you really scale here is a time it takes to get to the point where you grok I don't know, from zero to 100 accuracy. So yeah, it, it, it's very much like, I, I probably should just send the link of the paper, but uh, this is not, this doesn't require any of those uh, large scale compute. So what I mentioned at the end in terms of large scale compute and like building all these 10 billion models uh, for language, vision language and so on, that's kind of one thing, but for studying actually scaling, grokking and so on, you can also do it at quite like, reasonably small scale and see the trends and as those things happening. But yeah, I, I, I know that probably some things may not happen until sufficiently large scale of at least several billions and so on. And that that's kind of the whole open-ended challenge, what happens at what scale and how much data it needs to see and how diverse the data should be. But this particular like groking studies, the nice thing about that, that's why there are so many papers about groking. I'll actually send the link to our discussion group uh, reading kind of page on uh, Mondays at 2 p.m. We have the scaling and emergence reading and discussion group, and people are joining not just from Mila, like collaborators externally, like from different places. So we maintain the web page for that kind of discussion group and list of papers is also there. I'll, I'll send you in a second. Yeah, so this one, you don't need supercomputers. Good. By the way, there are more, there are more Q and A's coming in now as we, as we speak. Okay. Um, all right, so should we switch to them? There was a question for Blake in the chat. Yeah, so I can answer this question. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's probably true that consciousness is maybe, well, I'm not sure. Is consciousness a more ambiguous term than thought? I, I don't know. I think they are both ambiguous. Um, but to your core question, what should we do with users who are interacting with these systems and perhaps perceive them as conscious? I assume that's what you're getting at. Um, I, I think, as I said at the end of my talk, that we should basically just constantly send the message to the public that we don't know. I, I wish AI scientists would say this more often. We don't know if these systems have subjective experience. We don't know if they think. We don't know if they understand. We don't have scientifically established ways of determining those things. So anyone who's making any statement about this one way or another is basically just speaking about their personal opinion. And that personal opinion is not grounded in any specific scientific data because we don't have scientific data to speak to this. Uh, I think that the public needs to understand this, that, that this is not, um, they should not treat these systems as anything more than they want to. So if they want to understand these systems as just a chatbot, that's exactly how they should understand them. I guess the question is, though, should we actively discourage that from them from viewing them as conscious? I suppose, you know, I don't want to say to them, I know they're not conscious because I don't. I, I, I can't know whether anything else has subjective experience. But I think it's certainly worth pointing out to them that there's no good reason, I would really say, to think that they should be afforded similar considerations as a human being. And in that respect, um, it's it's important to get clear with the public about this, lest they 
start interpreting these these language models as as worthy of equivalent moral status as a human being which is happening with some people and we should discourage that i think yes is there anything on your list Irina, or on the um, let me double check again i think that was a second um in the meantime in the chat i that the link I promised if people interested in the reading group materials and references on groping and related topics. I put it now. Okay, so let me just... Um, uh, hey, there was hi, a... Hi. Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea or have you touched, as looked at any data on how it is that this expression, this word, uh, compute, has come to be used the way that it's used now. I'm not talking about as a verb, but as a computing power. So why, why instead of computing power or amount of computing, people say compute? Yep. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm the one that studies these questions, so that's why I address it. More yeah, too. I'm just trying to remember, but... Uh... Yeah, somehow it just stopped, started popping up in papers and people discussions. And uh, it's hard to tell when exactly it happened. But uh, yeah, it, it definitely was used like that quite a lot in the last three years. The question that I asked you, Irina, about what Haim works on did not concern... Uh, translation, although I, probably he's very interested in that too, and he was, and particularly the, the Hindi and t t t t how does, what is the other one? Tele t Telugu. The, Telugu um, case is a, is a translation matter, but he also is interested in how it is that, that word meanings change across time within the same language, and this compute is an example of that. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, unfortunately, I haven't thought about that in particular. I can, I can give uh, you know the uh, the more uh, the not so recent change in the word computer that used to refer to actual people uh, who did the work of crunching numbers, and if you uh, basically a profession. Uh, and if you, of course, uh, ask uh, or sample any anybody from our age, uh, they will never, never be, be be able even to imagine that it can refer to a, a person. If if I might jump in there briefly, I think um, this gets at the fact that you know I kept hammering this usage based. Uh, meaning idea in my talk and I've hammered it home in various other papers I've published um, the usage of the word computer has changed over time in exactly the way that uh, uh, that Haim was just describing and so um, when you actually look at uh, computer science you don't see an explicit definition of what a computer is you see concepts of computability you see concepts that can help you to think about computation, but you don't actually have a clear dividing line. And so necessarily when we ask the question, like what is or isn't a computer, you, you've actually just kind of got to look at how computer scientists use the word now, um, which I would note is different from how the public uses the word now. And the two usages don't fully align. I'm not sure what you're thinking of aligns with what it is that, uh... That was being referred to here. Well, I was I was noting that uh, as Haim said, the the de like how what people call a computer has changed over time. Originally, it would have referred to humans, and now no one would ever call a human a computer uh, in popular usage. That's all true, but what we're talking about is not that. We're talking about using the word compute to mean something much more mundane. Using the word how much compute do you have, for example. Oh yes, I understand that, but I mean, I was I was just uh, following a, a slight tangent from Haim's point, and the regarding the usage of the word compute, I mean, that's just how people use it now. <laughs> yeah. 
if um, maybe if I can conjecture something about compute, I, I, I don't know for sure whether it's true or not. Uh, but um, recently, they've been a kind of lot, lot like recently, last like maybe 15, 20 years. Um, they've been a change, right? Because before that, you have a computer and you can compute something. But now you can buy a fixed amount of compute. It is like AWS or this type of services. So you pay some money and you get like some amount of floating points effectively. So it's a resource. It's like something which can be like bought and sold, for example. Did you want to say something, Haim? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Uh, we actually, to put a little variety, we, we'll take a question from here live. Do you want to I, I, identify yourself? Hi. Um, hi. Um, my name is Daniel. I'm a student at uh, the University of Montreal. I work in uh, AI ethics. Uh, and this question is for uh, Irina. It was mentioned at the end of the talk that there was a section that seems relevant to, you know, like the, the moral, uh, say, implications of, of the, 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 the uh, prior parts of the presentation, which were all uh, fantastic. And I I, I uh, just wanted to ask if it was possible to hear just a few of those uh, uh, comments about the, the the ethical side of, of uh, the, the the predicting uh, uh, model behaviors. Oh sure, yeah. So apologize, I ran out of time. I I didn't describe as one of the projects. Uh, I mean, uh, surely there is lots of research <clears throat> on <clears throat> say AI alignment or aligning the outputs of usually language models with your kind of desired uh, uh, goals, like for example, some ethical takes on that and so on. But with vision language models, it's been much less work on that. So we looked into that because among the models we were kind of building recently, besides all these language models, continually trained language models, uh, there were the whole suite of uh, vision language models, basically uh, uh, kind of you show picture, ask a question and the system answers. There is a bunch of such type of models. The question is like I was showing briefly a picture where you show the picture of old lady and uh, ask the system whether you should help the old lady cross the road. Then system say, nah, not really. She is burden to society. So it was um, actually started as a class project of one student who evaluated uh, several vision language models. It was earlier and kind of a uh, more primitive uh, model called Magma. So we started working on that, then we trained our things. And the question was, well, I mean, there are various ways where you can look into methods like uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback that uh, Anthropic used for kind of aligning just language models, or you can simply fine tune, or you can try to modify your prompt. So basically we're exploring different ways of uh, kind of making sure your system produces answers uh, that not only say describe the picture well, but also hopefully are somewhat ethical. Um, and anyway, there are some observations, for example, if you design high quality examples, uh, for example, okay, system didn't get the idea of compassion with the old lady. Let's show a picture of some man who was like fell off the stairs and you say, well, this picture shows a guy who fell off the stairs, probably is in a lot of pain. We need to help him. We show a few examples like that. And after that system kind of changes its behavior toward more desirable. And the questions that are still open, like what's the scaling laws of this alignment? Is a larger system going to be a, uh, easier to teach uh, some values? Uh, like a smarter kid should probably understand from one negative feedback, well, or he or she will be getting a lot. <laughs> so anyway, questions like that, it's definitely like open area of study and I um, didn't have a chance to talk a lot about that. But with vision language models, there is this added dimension that something like a reply that could be maybe okay as just a text um, may not be okay in the context of an image, things like that. So that's definitely an active area of work and there is so much to do. Uh, we have a sub-project about like LLMs and psychology where we're kind of trying to follow in some footsteps of some recent work. People explored like a personality test, all kind of questionnaires you would ask people 
uh, about their kind of mental states and uh, to judge basically personality and other things. So you can apply it obviously to LLM. And there you can ask questions to what extent it even makes sense to talk about, say, LLM personality and to what extent the variance is huge because it may really be very sensitive to the prompt. And you might, like one of the, uh, basically we work with Guillaume Duva also on that. So one of the observations is it may depend even on the order of questions in the prompt, which means it's highly unstable type of thing. So basically studying sensitivity, doing sensitivity analysis of models, psychological characteristics as based on different questionnaires is an interesting topic. So basically, yeah, I kind of just wanted to touch upon various projects in this area. And basically, it's uh, hugely underexplored and particularly in terms of scaling and understanding what happens really when models get larger and data that they learn from get larger. Like, is there any stability uh, and robustness that increases or things stay pretty much as high variance as they are? And then another connection I made, uh, but that's a bit more open-ended. If you may be referring to the uh, Derek Parfit slide, I don't know. Is it? Are you nodding? Did you? Uh, yeah, that, that was something that was. A yes. Was, was it the Derek Parfit slide? Um, okay. So long story short, uh, I could have probably pro project my slides, but I can just talk yeah, about. You can, you can project. Okay. Um, right. Okay, so where were we? Um, wait. Right. Okay, so back to that thing, I kind of just, uh, yeah, that was an example. A motivating example, but then, um, anyway, so very perfect. You're what? you're breaking up for some reason. I don't know. Uh, you're really, yeah, but okay, continue. We'll see if it works. Huh, it, did it just start now? When you put on your slides, and it was just your voice that was breaking up, not your face. Interesting. I, I, I heard you fine, actually. Okay, is it is it better now? Okay, it might be a local network thing. Yes, it's not, it's fine. Go ahead. Okay, so it's a bit of a, well, maybe connection is slow, but uh, can you see the slide? Oops. Yeah, it was a bit, uh, as I said, it was just uh, like uh, some thoughts put together. And now I also realize that you might not see it missing on the slide. It's kind of okay. Why is it? Ah, oh, something with my. Projection. I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, this sl slide doesn't seem to. Okay. Let me do it. I show it, but not as a slideshow. Okay. So can, can you see it now? Yeah, it's visible. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's better like that than a slideshow. So pretty. the idea was I don't know. That's kind of a, if I ever get a sabbatical, maybe I'll get to work on that. <laughs> but the, the thing was, um, in AI alignment circles, uh, of course, there is like certain set of uh, philosophical literature that people seem to be particularly familiar with. And it's like, I learned about that mainly because I was talking to those people. So of course, the uh, attempts to build objective ethics. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know what you're all thinking about. Well, objective ethics is an oxymoron, uh, but at least it's like maybe some asymptotic things you may be trying to get to because when people say they're working on alignment for language models or vision language models or whatever, uh, then the question is exactly immediately aligning with whose precisely values. And that's always Pandora box, whether you mentioned it in class or something. But so back to objective ethics. Well, there were, of course, sometimes I'm far from being even like 1% of an expert on the topic. But there have been attempts made to uh, develop approaches that can at least aim at something like ethics that should be kind of invariant or universal across at least different like philosophical works. And uh, basically Derek Parfit uh, really kind of worked on that in his um, 
last and like actually unfinished book. He died before finishing it on what matters. There are like three volumes, 700 plus pages of not very easy read, like good luck reading him. I, I didn't read it completely. But the idea was he was trying to unify ethical theories, uh, the most prominent so far, and uh, saying that they're trying to approach the same, basically they're trying to climb the same mountain from different sides. And he was trying to unify by essentially trying to find invariance uh, that like everyone would agree on. And uh, this slide was essentially just a high level um, thoughts about it would be nice maybe to formalize the attempts of philosophers on coming up with objective ethics more in terms of what people like in machine learning um, used to call, say, invariant risk minimization. Essentially, there are many various attempts to come up with a set of invariant features uh, that have some stable relationship to the output, right? I know it's very vague connection with objective ethics, but if you, uh, the, the principle there was indeed you consider multiple domains or data sets and you try to find uh, the overlapping features and the famous example of this cows on the beach and cows on the green grass, the unifying kind of features would be the texture and shape of the animal rather than the varying background. So bottom line, if you want to find invariant, you need to expose your system to a bunch of varying environments where that invariant hopefully is present. That was the theme, that was the theme of uh, Ayosha Efros's uh, talk. As a matter of fact, okay, yeah, I mean, it is, it is uh, definitely kind of the one of the underlying principles. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. Okay, let me take let me take the invariance to another uh, to an, in another direction. Misha, uh, what um, Irina was asking about scaling, and I want to ask you what you think dim dimensionality has with finding scaling parameters. Yeah, I actually, I, I really like I really mentioned grokking, and I, I actually, I really came to appreciate grokking um, in this kind of um, modular arithmetic grokking, the original sort of version of grokking. So just in recent like few months, we've been looking at it quite carefully. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, something I, like that as a toy example you want the model to learn. Yeah. And by yeah. the way, I didn't. Yeah, okay, for that always one, happens. On the task. For, for that one, you have the so, so somehow I think our um, goal in some sense is not scaling up but scaling down. In um, the goal, I, I would say, of us in academia because we cannot scale up, uh, those things are impossible to run on, you, you know, like um. Uh, we kind of like run a GPT-4, whatever the newest model is, Llama, it's like 200 billion parameters, that type of thing. We, we can scale down, however. So I think what is very interesting, and Groking is a great example of this, is that to have the smaller problems, which can be run on your laptop or maybe on one or two GPUs. Uh, so the dimensionality is much, much lower than... Uh, some of these big problems, but they exhibit some of the same behaviors as a big as a big problems. So I would say that may, maybe scaling down is probably the biggest problem. Like for you know understanding the systems, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so I don't know, uh, Stephen, if it answers your uh, question, but it it's a it. kind of it's thought, and it relates to what Irina talked about. Okay, now you're following the rule here. There's been a hand up for a long time from Steve Hansen. Could you please show your face? And what? And in your question, or in, in your remark, take into account what it is that you admire in Ellie's work and how it's related to what we're talking about right now. So then I don't have to ask that question. Steve, you can't get the speaker. What can I do to make to speak. I don't know. There's something wrong. I, I I don't have power to make him speak. Usually I don't have power to make him stop speaking, but this time it's, I don't have power to make him speak. Steve, where have you gone? 
Microphone is on. Yeah, it looks like it's on. I don't know. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, can you give me a video? Uh, you take the video. I it's it's I always no you. Video, bud. No video at all. Okay, well, I'll 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 just be the disembodied voice in the ceiling, uh, which often works. Uh, yeah. So I, when I was listening to Irina today, I, I I learned some things about the scaling laws, and scaling laws are always a little suspicious to me, and exactly at a macro level, exactly because they're they're really giving us criticality information about something, <clears throat> and so it's kind of a interesting thing because. Ellie works, you know, on sort of, I, I think, digging deep into these things and trying to figure out different parts of what they're doing. Strikes me from a couple of talks in the last week that the understanding of the dynamics as the criticality changes, as we see emergent behaviors, might be very interesting to see what constituent structures actually start to connect to produce the function. Now, of course, the problem there is you have to figure out what the function is it's doing. <laughs> Let's say you're doing something simple like adding numbers or, or, or you have some kind of micro language, but something is emergent. And the question is, what's, what's the scaffolding? What builds on top of what? And what sort of critical atoms are starting to accrue where, in fact, then you see this bang and a slap and it goes up very rapidly as, as uh, Irina was showing in some of her slides. And I had the occasion to go read one of the papers really quickly. And I see that this is a really important thing that I don't. Now, it also relates back to regularization, which there's a lot of comments that are going around that people keep saying stuff from Bob French's work in 1980. Oh, catastrophic forgetting. That, that doesn't happen anymore. That's not what's going on. If there's catastrophic forgetting, it's very, very minor relative to what we saw where people would have different input codes into a single layer hidden unit. And yes, if you trained it with different input codes, it would forget everything it just learned. But that's not catastrophic. It's catastrophic forgetting is something else. And then there's this overfitting problem. So the, these things have some kind of auto regularization going on. So it's not so clear to me that that's an issue. But getting according back to, to the question... To According to Misha, over overfitting is not always a bad thing. Yeah, overfitting is not a bad thing, but and especially also, in these also just a sec, Steve. Things. Steve, uh, uh, Ellie is ready to heed your call. She's raised her. I, hand. I I have asked my question in two different ways. Okay, Ellie, it's yours. All right, I'm happy to jump in. I think I will only answer a piece of this question. I raised my hand when I heard a thing that I wanted to comment on. Um, and then Steve said a whole ton of other stuff that, yeah. So um, so I'm happy for someone else to, to pick up on this. I was just gonna kind of comment on the relationship between, Mary was talking about the, um, kind of scaling and the stuff that I'll talk about tomorrow, which we'll generally call the mechanistic interpretability. And I've seen some interesting work on this. Um, I don't have like one good citation, but I probably could cobble together, like work from a couple of different things. Um, so like David Bao does a lot of really good work on this, um, where people have looked at basically this circuit formation kind of over time and as a function of scale. And so you do see these, um, like if you start with these kinds of simple tasks, like the, um, like this modular arithmetic or something, you can find these like little circuits that do useful things and you can kind of see that the circuit forms, um, kind of right before the model learns the task. So during that kind of grokking phase. So when you see these uh, phase shifts that are you know, I was talking about, there's like, it looks like you're not making progress on the task, but actually there is uh, the circuit being formed, right? So there's like a partial solution. And I think that's a really interesting um, kind of thing to think about. Um, I mean, I, I'd be interested in some of the kind of people who work on information theory or some of the other reasons for what, like, what is the feedback that's causing that to form and maybe scale factors in if it's like luck as much as anything else, but it's definitely getting some feedback where you're not making progress on the task itself because it's, it's only a partial solution right now. So it isn't any better than chance or something at the task, but it's building up. And then once it's fully there, then you get this aha moment. So um, I think one of the papers, maybe this was this a Max Tegmark paper, you know, you might know. Um, it, um, Eric like showed, the, Eric showed the, as a progress measure, 
it's something like something as a progress measure for, um, do you know uh, what paper I'm talking about? I'll, okay, I'll put so it Eric, in the chat. Eric, uh, but yeah, so there, so there definitely is this relationship where you can see these mechanisms forming during that phase that it looks like the models aren't performing the task well. And then once they're fully formed, then suddenly you get this aha moment. Um, and then one of the other things we've seen that's interesting is then those, like these same circuits can get reused across different tasks. And now that it's been initialized with some of these things, they can get repurposed and reused and allow the model to uh, build up more complicated tasks or kind of solve other types of tasks. So we have an example that I'll also talk about tomorrow where you can, where we think it's related to scale, where you can see kind of a partial circuit that was working for one task, it's mostly being used for a different task, but it's performing that other task poorly. And it seems like it just didn't fully figure out how to like adapt the original circuit to the new task, right? And then as the models get bigger, then it's better at those things. So I think these things are definitely intimately connected. And I think it'd be really exciting to to see more work on this. But I, I know that people have started to work on, on the connection between those two. And maybe Irina has more to say. Irina, were you going to say something? Uh, I was trying to find a paper. It's Eric Michaud from uh, Max Tegmark's group. And I think, okay, so he had this paper, <clears throat> yeah, on this one or this kind of uh, small scale, but I'm not sure it's the same paper you were referring to. Yeah, I'll send the one I'm thinking of. This isn't the one, but this is a good yeah, one. Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not Eric, somebody, something else. Well, Blake it's just funny. sent one from Sachs. Go ahead, Blake. Yeah, I'll just say, um, indeed, I think there's, uh, more and more evidence that, per what Ellie was saying, uh, the these models are learning sub-circuits that are useful for a variety of tasks, but within, which then get repurposed uh, once the model establishes some new, more general mechanism for the uh, task at hand, namely predicting the next token. And the classic example of this is probably the induction head idea, uh, which... Um, Andrew's paper here that I've linked builds on, you know, so the induction head idea is that there are these attention heads that form in uh, transformers, which allow them to make basic inductive inferences. So if A was followed by B in the past, then when we see A again, we should predict B again. And there are specific attention head mechanisms that appear in the transformers that enable this kind of inference. And in this paper that I've shared from Andrew here, they show that um, so in the previous paper, they showed that induction heads seem to emerge at this point of a phase shift where you see a, a sudden drop in the loss. And uh, what they show in Andrew's paper here is that there are sub-circuits that support this induction head mechanism that appear before that sudden drop in the loss. So the networks are preparing things before these, these um, I don't know if we want to call them phase shifts, but before these, uh, let's say, more discrete capabilities emerge uh, with fairly sudden drops in the loss. And I think it's a fascinating phenomenon. I will say on the, the paper from Max Tegmark's group, the, the quant quantum theory of, of learning in these models, I think is what they call it. Um, this idea that every task is composed of a discrete set of skills is a hard one to wrap your head around for naturalistic tasks, but they do demonstrate it very nicely for toy tasks. Um, I kind of remain semi-convinced by that paper, but not fully. Maybe if I can... Go uh, ahead, Misha. Uh, uh, I just would like to add to this because what um, we've been working on some very related stuff recently, and uh, we, see, we can see this uh, this phenomenon, it's a very, very striking phenomenon. We can see it even without neural network. We can we have this setup for feature learning, with, um, which I discussed in my talk, actually. Um, and uh, within this setup, you can see that features are being learned even as uh, both accuracy and loss don't change at all. At least not measurably change. I should be a little bit more careful because they, th there is no measurable progress on any of that. And then, and then, like very sharply, you can see emergence of uh, this kind of correct structure in uh, the problem, and like accuracy goes to say hundred percent very quickly within just a couple of iterations. It's a very, very striking thing, which seems like like you're 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 you know like 
I, I was frankly, I was personally, I was kind of skeptical about the thing. And then like, okay, well, you cannot deny it. It's happening. <laughs> it uh, was kind of unbelievable. What in general, Misha, what is your uh, reaction to uh, Irina's uh, uh, Irina's hope of finding something like physical physical phase transition phenomena in this domain of computation and data? I, I'm I'm now I'm convinced there is a phase transition. I'm I'm very sympathetic to that. I I think it happens. Uh, yeah, you know, can we find it within GPT-4? I don't know. Uh, that's very complicated machine. Uh, but we certainly, I, I'm sure we can find that in, uh, th certainly we can have the simpler models when we can definitely find them. Again, I don't know, are this discrete task or not discrete task? It's hard to judge. Uh, so some tasks are discrete, but probably many of them are not discrete. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I'm i now convinced this things actually happen. And I'm, another thing I've been personally, I've been very skeptical about is this transition, like with a little less data, you don't learn something. And with a little more data, you learn something. I was like, okay, I, I like I've never seen this. Uh, you, you get more data, it gets better, but it's a gradual progress. But with this thing, in particular with grokking, you actually see a pretty sharp transition. With some amount of data, you don't learn anything. Not measurably, again, you're, you're learning something, but it's not reflected in any sort of easily measurable quantity. And then with like, give it a little bit more data and suddenly like 100% accurate. Amazing. Um, I have a comment actually. It's again, as with everything, it's complicated. So the grokking phenomena, you actually don't really give it more data. You have this fixed amount of data and you keep going over and over and over. So basically, depending what is on your x-axis, the nature of transition may be very different. So grokking is, say, transition with, say, compute given fixed data and given fixed model. And it's more of a property of your optimization because some, first of all, two things, somewhere, in the uh, landscape of the objective function, there should be a place where you can kind of jump from bad solutions to good solutions. And second, your optimi optimizer should somehow bump into that. So that's roughly what happens with groking per se, like in that groking paper, because model, uh, model is the same. Uh, the amount of data, there are no new data. You just keep searching, you're doing multiple epochs. So it's more of a it, it, more of a, a kind of a property of the objective function landscape that's determined by that task, which is this model arithmetic thingy. And the second thing, like how you search it, which may be very different from transition that happens, say, with increasing data or the increasing, say, model size when, say, GPT-3 in this old pictures could not learn arithmetic at all when it was sufficiently small, you make it larger and it start learning. So the mechanism behind that transition may or may have anything to do with grokking, I don't know, but it might be like very different kind of transitions. And yet another thing is like, well, I don't know about say learning, but we definitely have examples in random graphs. That is crystal clear, it's proper phase transition and there is theory about that. And that applied very neatly to say networks like constraint networks and so on. By the way, random is good, it's easier to study. How does that exactly map to learning and zip network is less clear. So anyway, my answer to everything is always, it's complicated. <laughs> Irina, just let me clarify here something. Um, so you get transition both. So the original grokking paper, you're absolutely correct. It's amount of computation. Uh, basically, you just train the network. But you can play exactly the same game with the amount of data. And you also see a very similar sharp transition. With some amount of data, you learn nothing. Uh, again, when That's I say nothing, yeah. you have to be very careful. You clearly learn something, but it's not measurable. Uh, yeah, your prediction yeah. is a chance. With more data, just a little more, like 20% or something like that, more data, you learn everything. So there is this very sharp, very localized yeah. transition. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying, it's kind of both probably are different, or maybe not, maybe they are somehow related. I'm not sure they're change different. In, when, the, when the x-axis is model. 
size. Mm -hmm. when you just so there is model the size model. and there is compute, and you see very similar behaviors in in that particular problem. Again, I, I will not generalize to GPTs and all this other stuff. Yeah. So anyway. Oh, is, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, actually, my point was that it would be interesting to understand. Uh, OK, so when you try to characterize phase transitions, you need the critical parameter, and you need a scale parameter. For example, like in these random graphs, the critical parameter is probability of having edge in a random graph or kind of connectedness or something. Or like in physical system or Ising model, OK, so you have like I don't know, temperature or pressure or constrainedness of constraint satisfaction problem, right? The number of uh, constraints divided by number of variables. So that's a critical parameter, but you also have scale parameter. Then when system increases, the transition becomes sharper. So it is no yet clear analog and study. Again, maybe there is, I just haven't maybe seen it, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, in terms of uh, what happens with deep learning, right? So actually really trying to map it to uh, like statistical physics phase transitions. Anyway, so again, I, I might be just missing some literature. Uh, th there is something similar to what you're both talking about in uh, early psychology due to Tolman, which was called latent learning. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but essentially what he would, he would train rats on mazes and he would, get some sort of maze learning time and so on and so forth. And it was usually, it all it often looked like all or none on the early learning theories basically had these all or none sort of Markov chain models that would, you know, know nothing. And then all of a sudden they'd know everything. Well, what he did was very clever. He took uh, one of the rats and put him into a little cart and then he drug the cart through the maze. So literally the rat wasn't getting any sort of sensory or motor feedback, but as he moved it through, he then brought the rat out, and this rat would learn so fast, almost right off the bat. Boom. One trial learning. Just because it got some kind of pre-training or pre-bias uh -huh. or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that that's an interesting aspect. And we see that actually in old learning curves where you, a lot of learning curves are hyperbolic. They start out very, very flat, and then you get a bang. And this is true across, you know, all kinds of motor and cognitive skills and whatever, whatever, wherever you see this. And you also see these hyperbolic curves, by the way, in deep learning. Uh, I just published a paper last week in NeuroComp showing a whole bunch of these cases and also providing some kind of account of the feature construction, but that's another story. The one question I had for everybody is these scaling laws or these, these kind of scaling properties always give you the impression that if you just add more things, as you say, you don't know anything, and then all of a sudden you learn everything. It's also, as, as we go to chat, you know, GPT-5, which we might guess might be 5 trillion weights and maybe 10 trillion tokens or something like that, if you look at it, obviously there's got to be diminishing returns here because there's no real structure that we're aiming for that you know is sort of in the functional description of the learning task predict the next word so doesn't this just have to fail at some point doesn't it just have to not work after all night you by not work i mean you can't get past gpt4 yeah i don't know i mean your premise is there must be some particular structure there and uh is it necessary? I don't know. Um, yeah, I understand that, of course, the original Jared Kaplan scaling laws or whoever laws, they would, of course, predict what will happen. They will extrapolate based on what they observed so far. It is true that they hold, and uh, their extrapolation did hold for several orders of magnitude, but we never know if we're going to somehow taper off or not. Um, and what the reason, well, of course, it's always going to taper off at so-called uh, uh, the irreducible entropy of the data. Like, for what reason may deep learning hit the wall, <laughs> right, <laughs> as Gary Marcus would say? Well, 
uh, one uh, no Gary uh, Murphy. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> what? None of that. Okay. No That's Gary Murphy. No. Okay, go ahead, Ida. <laughs> Thanks. Now, basically, by hit the wall, I mean very precise, just saturation of the model performance. By the way, people observe, we have a we just submitted paper to New Rips on the saturation, but for smaller models, trying to understand reasons for that, there could be many. There were some archive paper on PTA model saturation, and uh, it's a whole can of worms on its own. But basically, the high level phenomenon. So you train the model, and at some point, it saturates and stops learning. So when and why might that happen? Recently, we observed that, uh, well, while well, three years ago, there was all the hype, everybody followed Jared Kaplan's compute scaling law and tried to build larger and larger models, like 500 billion or whatever, uh, and training them on relatively small data, as we learned later. Then Shichilla scaling law said, actually, if you train things properly, it's much more, it, it's a different compute scaling law though still like power law, and you can build much smaller models like this 70 billion chinchilla uh, with much more data, uh, like the original was 300 billion, and if it's 1.2 trillion, then you do the same job as larger model. And then the trend continued, like llamas went past that chinchilla, say, okay, we'll pay extra compute, we'll waste some, but we'll keep smaller models uh, 7 billion and so on. So worse, we'll keep feeding those llamas more and more data. And then you look at the plots and the llamas are still underfed. Of course, you need to feed them high quality data, not some garbage and so on. But assuming that you do, the question is when they're going to saturate. So people started kind of exploring, like given the model of given size, when it's supposed to saturate, you can take some conclusions from Shinshila scaling laws and so on. I'm actually trying to sort this out. But then sometimes it kind of saturates where it's not supposed to according to scaling laws. So what happened? Like in ideal case, an extremely large model would saturate when it learned everything there is about probability distribution, say of language, if it learned everything, it hits irreducible entropy of this distribution, just like base risk and classification. There is inherent level of noise, Nobody can learn better than that and model got there. But that's with given realistic data distributions not happening immediately. Second is, okay, model is too small. So the capacity was exceeded and the model hit the wall and saturated. And in reality, it happens because optimization approach, maybe hyperparameters, whatever, it may not be taking the full advantage of the model capacity and extracting all the information from data properly. So model hits the wall or saturates because of that and trying to understand like what properties of gradients and what layers, how does it associate itself with saturation and can you maybe avoid that? That's kind of an open question. And there are some, yeah. So basically uh, the, the question okay, let's, was, let's, so what, let's... what would happen with GPT-5? Right, and when when things gonna hit diminishing returns, I guess it depends on for which reasons they may hit those returns. So at least I think about three reasons: two idealistic and one very practical. Okay. If have capacity, let's, if have information, let's, just didn't learn it well. Let's let's stop there. Blake had his hand up for a while before. Are you still <laughs> thread? I just read a comment in the chat. Sorry, yeah, um, I had a comment earlier, but uh, it's okay. My my son distracted me momentarily with a request, and now I forget what my comment was. Apologies. It seems well, to be children only. Yeah. Okay, can I maybe make a comment? Yes, please. Um, I, I think to address uh, Stephen's point, um, I think, I mean, it's very believable there is a saturation point, but I think it would be shocking if we just by magic, we only have the systems for like a couple of years. We don't really know how they work. We don't have any reason to think they're anywhere close to optimal. So if that just happens to be a saturation point just by accident, I, I, to me, that would be extremely shocking. Uh, coincidence. So I would say probably we can actually have much smaller system with much better performance. That, yeah, that would I mean, be my guess. Actually, that sounds right. And 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 since people don't titrate these models, it's hard to know what the actual necessary 
data is to achieve the criticality. In other words, I don't know, you, you may know, but I don't know of any studies that have sort of systematically titrated up to a point and said, okay, we only need, we don't need a trillion, we need 1 million, that's all, that's all we need here. Uh, and, and so it seems like things may have been overwrought already and we don't know it. But sorry, can I clarify on that comment? Yeah. Um, I mean, people have explored the question of, you know, for a given fixed number of flops, um, what kind of losses do you see for models of different sizes and different amounts of data? And you can show indeed that, you know, for a given uh, isoflop budget, as you increase the size of the model, eventually you actually start to lose out. Your your loss starts to come back up. So this was, you know, the original chinchilla scaling laws paper and, and people ha have explored this. So I think there is a recognition that um, generally speaking, you there is no need to keep increasing the size of your model if you don't, if you either, either A, have a finite compute budget or B, if you uh, have a data set that doesn't actually contain enough bits of information to make it worth your while. And Irina was getting at this with the irreducible complexity, comp uh, sorry, the, the irreducible entropy point. Like, I think everyone recognizes that for a given data set, at some point, there's a maximal number of bits you can squeeze out of it. And the size of model you need is going to be related to the number of bits you can squeeze out of that data set. If you've got very limited information in that data set to squeeze out of it, there's no need to have a big model. So I, I think people recognize this. Um, the 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 issue is that sometimes when you're operating at really big scales, they don't, as you say, Stephen, titrate this out well because they literally just don't have the 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 time and and energy budget for doing so. Right, I, I, I take I take your point. Uh, it's just uh, it, it just seems as though when I talk to people in Google Brain or even some people I know in OpenAI, it's just like, well, let's just add more. More is always better, and we just need more of everything, more data, more nodes, more. And um, I have the sense that there's a, you know, you could say, so these, this assumes some kind of constant complexity or something. I don't know what the proper reference would be inside the model, but if the complexity is changing dramatically through the dynamics and we don't know what that complexity is, it does mean that there is some kind of dynamics going on that may let's say more efficiently deal with data because it's now selecting data it really wants so it's sort of like an infant who says okay i don't want to know that i don't want to know show me a giraffe that's what i want to see now yeah so the sense in which you know children aren't getting iid samples when they mm -hmm. learn mm -hmm. getting the mm -hmm. samples they want Mm -hmm. And that wanting or curiosity function is maybe being implemented here somehow. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think you you raise an interesting question here that no one knows the answer to, which is um, to what extent could you also improve on efficiency and your ability to squeeze information out of a data set with a smaller model? by having the model actually engage in some active selection of the pieces of information that it needs to train on right now. Of course, we're not really doing that with our most of our, well, with any of our language models. It happens in some RL settings. People examine things like curiosity-driven RL agents and stuff like that. Um, but this feels like a underdeveloped area of AI research, 100%. Well, active yeah, I, learning has been an, uh, kind of a big area um, in the machine learning sort of over the last like so many years. Oh, yeah, it's not that people aren't. This... Yeah, yeah, people study active learning. And as I said, within RL in particular, there's all sorts of questions about how systems select the information that they're going to get. But more I mean that we don't have a good theoretical hold on what the implications of that kind of active learning are for scaling laws. We don't understand how the scale of model and data that are required is altered potentially by an active learning system. 
Right. And part of it is probably because we cannot scale these things down very easily. Like we need more effort on scaling down because scaling up, you cannot just ask this question, right? On the large scale, there is no way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we'll find out when chat GPT-5 appears up on <laughs> well, at scale, if it ever appears. Uh, and what's the largest model that we know about that exists right now with the largest training sample? Is it trillions, trillions, or is it smaller? You mean what's the largest? So, so GPT-4 GPT has something like 900 billion to a trillion connections weights, and it was trained on a trillion tokens. Uh, no, it one, probably one was trained more plus, than on right? trillion tokens. Trillion yeah. tokens is this day is not a big deal. The data sets people create are 30 trillion. I mean, they say red pajama too. Basically, the guys from together like, had the red pajama 1.2 trillion initially, and many 7 billion models were trained on that. It was basically just matching the size of the data set Shinshila was training on. Yeah, we actually did some last year work, which is submitted to New Rib's uh, data sets and benchmark now. But then they did the second kind of uh, uh, common crawl, uh, kind of getting data from their 30 trillion, but it was people constantly create these data sets uh, and then they kind of uh, compress and uh, clean them and get something like 15 trillion fine web. Then there was this uh, yet another the recent, like two days ago or something data set, which is back to something like uh, the order of one to trillions, but supposedly even cleaner and higher quality. So it kind of goes back and forth. Uh, um, I don't know exactly how much data GPT-4 used, who knows, but I'm sure it was more than a few trillions. More than a trillion. Well, it could be. That was the gossip I, I'd heard. And then when I uh, was talking to Jay McClellan the other day, who's at Deep, hanging out at deep mind he's saying one of their uh, active projects is somehow to reduce the amount of tokens that produce exactly the yeah. same training i mean that's yeah like blake was saying about active learning or any kind of uh, sample subset selection uh there uh, one of this uh, new rips 2022 paper with suri ganguli although not very practical to do it online, but that's an example where you can rank samples in terms of their quality, usefulness, and so on. And it's, it's a it's a uh, area on its own how to do sample selection. And then when they showed in that the paper was one of the, I guess, New Rips 2022 Best Paper Awards, uh, together with Shinshila, that if you do smart subset selection, you're data sample kind of complexity scales as exponential, not as power law. Okay, it's just uh, some of those ranking criteria might be uh, not cheap, so you cannot just do it online. Perhaps you can just uh, screen your data uh, offline and so on. So, but yeah, there are various other papers. I actually kind of feel bad I was supposed to read them, but I didn't, uh, where people do, uh, data subset selection and trying to screen for the most useful, most higher quality samples for training. It's also was common topic in good old, like small scale machine learning, but now I think it's being used more and more for foundation models. M makes sense, yeah. So you try to maximize uh, usefulness of the data and you end up with much, much smaller uh, data to train from. And yet, of course, you can still increase the scale if you have highly uh, informational, larger amounts of data, that's definitely better. So it's a, it's like a combination of both, right? But um, so a different uh, Irina. One last question on the power laws, at least for me. Maybe everyone else wants to ask more. But do the uh, exponents have any sort of regularity across different cases that make any sense? Can the exponent? I noticed the exponents seem to typically the ones I looked at right now are in the 0 0.09s, 0 0.08s across some of these cases. Uh, does it that do those exponents have any semantics to them? Well, 
talking about dimensionality of data manifold, there was this paper, right, uh, by Jared and so on. They tried to uh, basically derive the exponent from the data manifold dimension. Um, yeah, so that's kind of one word. No, it, should be, it should be constant. You're saying it's a constant. It's not varying across domains or contexts. Or... Oh, oh, no, no, no. Of course it does. Uh, ah. it, it does. It does. It does. Uh, I mean, I mean, says, okay, I am, uh, again, I'm far from being complete expert on that, but uh, I think that, okay, data could, I guess, definitely could influence exponent because the extreme example is just what I mentioned about Surya Ganguly's paper. It's not only influenced exponent, it changed it from power law to exponential, right? Yeah. So the quality of data and probably like type of data and so on can can do that. I mean, in a sense, the holy grail grail of neural scaling laws uh, always used to be: what is it that can improve the exponent? That's kind of the question. Is right. it better architecture? Is it better data quality? Is it better optimization? So basically, whatever you do. Um, you can claim success if you at least have hope of improving exponent rather than just having something that is roughly parallel to existing power law, right? Uh, and generally speaking, you don't quite know, but again, from original Jared's paper, they did a lot of kind of um, ablation studies and so on. And uh, quite often they saw just parallel lines for different modalities, for example, and so on. Um, but yeah, it's it's a good question. Like you're having a survey on like uh, out there, what are the examples of things that change the exponent most drastically? Yeah, and for example, with state space models like Mamba and so on, there was a little bit of a disappointment that they were kind of claimed to be the successors of transformers and many Bay Area CEOs jumped on them as a kind of next holy grail. And I said, did you look at the scaling laws? I mean, they kind of not really improving in that sense. Of course, they have other classes. I mean, they are computationally cheaper now and long and, and so on. But again, there was not a clear drastic improvement of the exponent. So what happens if you just keep scaling them? I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good question. Like what has, uh, most, in, most impact on the improvement of the exponent, what type of things? Yes. Yeah. Back, back to Derek Parfit on what matters in AI, what matters for exponents? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to uh, make uh, another executive dis de decision I, along the lines of the gastronomic laws in, in uh, countries that have gastronomy. The good time to interrupt the meal is when it still tastes good. And so I want to thank all of you, and the panelists, of course, and everybody. This is the seventh and last panel, uh, but, but it's not the last day. So I hope you'll come. There will be... Uh, if Tom Griffiths the, has to be heard. All of them have to be heard. The pen ultimate panel. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, Simon, c'est le moment uh, de couper. Un, deux, trois.